Big treat today, I've tracked down one of the most successful experts in world financial matters, and you are going to learn a ton. The nefarious kind of gray matter that is the central banks and what's their real motive, all of this is, is creepy stuff. And none of us know all the answers from Davos to the BIS really knows who's the trigger pullers and what their ultimate motives are. But they're generally not for the mass majority of people. The vast majority of people are the plankton. They are the plankton for these banking whales, as I've said many times. And so prepare yourself. You want to prepare by speculating, taking risks. You want to prepare by owning gold. You want to prepare by trying to try Bitcoin or whatever. That's up to each of you to get informed. Hey all, welcome to the home of sound science and no misinformation. And today I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to get into the world of finances. So you may find it very helpful to know the macroeconomy and what's going on in the world and where it may be going in terms of personal choices, but no financial advice, of course. Uh, today I have Matthew Piepenberg, who is an incredibly expert uh, guest, and he's been on many of the shows in the financial world, and I've been stunned by his knowledge and even more so his judgment. So great to see you, Matthew, in person. Well, thanks, Ivor. I'm really, really happy to talk with you and go into some of these themes and make it hopefully make some sense out of the, the insane right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of been nuts in many ways, but today we'll just talk about the financial world nutsness. And uh, I thought we'd start off maybe if you just gave a brief background. I know you have multiple languages. You've been in Europe, America, Stanford originally. Maybe just give an overview of your kind of career to date briefly. Sure, sure. Yeah, I was, um, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a strange American in the sense that I'm as American as apple pie. Grew up in the Midwest, played baseball, you know, with the cornfields behind the infield and and uh you know but yet we came from the midwest which has a very german influence and a german kind of town everyone in my school yearbook seemed to have a german last name and through baseball i was able to get some scholarships out to the east coast and go to some fancy schools um uh brown and then at uh university of michigan and for law school and a master's at harvard so i studied the constitution i studied philosophy i studied economics i studied markets i studied the laws and the values of our founding fathers i studied sound money a lot of those things that I studied, I kind of had to reevaluate re in the last 15 or so years. But in the interim, you know, I came from a German family. As I went to school in Germany, I worked at a German bank during the summers, married a beautiful French woman, raised my kids in France. So I'm a, an American with a German background, working in Zurich, living in France um, and uh, speaking German in, in, in certain contexts and French, too. But um Basically, I consider myself an American expat living overseas right now, um, and uh, but with a very global understanding, not just intellectually or you know theoretically, but you know the zeitgeist of being on the streets and from London to Zurich to Paris, certainly now and and uh, you know Bordeaux or Frankfurt. There's there's a lot that's different and unique about each of these places, from Washington to Barcelona. But there's a lot that's very similar, and um, it's fascinating to get a kind of a, a voyeur's view of that from a personal perspective, but clearly on a financial perspective too. I get to see uh, what people are thinking on the ground, and I get to talk to some fancy people who are making policies, good or bad, and I get to talk to really interesting clever investors who have their own opinions and between that whole mix that whole famishum melange whatever you want to call it i've derived some some pretty strong convictions on what's working and not working and what needs to be understood for everyone whether they're in financial markets or not i think it can be understood if a little bit of common sense a little bit of effort it can be understood Excellent. And that's that's some history, all right. And pretty much spent in the world of finance as well. And I think you're, you're a senior partner in Matterhorn uh, Capital Management. Yep. Yeah, we're, we're a Zurich-based operation that deals exclusively in physical precious metals, primarily gold and silver. Um, we have our own in-house brokerage desk, our own storage facilities in an undisclosed location in the Swiss Alps, which is kind of like something you've seen in a James Bond movie because we don't believe in holding gold in a, in a commercial bank because of banking risk. Um, Switzerland still has the best privacy, that perfect privacy and the best neutrality, though not perfect neutrality. Um, but we're really about, I joke all the time that I'm an insurance salesman and a landlord. I sell, I sell insurance, which is gold because it's insurance against fiat money that's losing its purchasing power. And we can talk about why and how that's the case. And I'm a landlord because we charge a fee to hold that gold to, to sit in the ground and stare back at you. Uh, but um, 
yeah, our views on physical precious metals aren't about gold bulls or gold bugs. It's just our views on currency risk and our views on currency risk stem from debt risk and our debt risk comes from common sense and looking at the right data points. And, you know, again, without getting complex, we could talk about what debt means and what bonds mean and what yields mean because it sounds all fancy and markets. And I was a hedge fund manager during the dot-com bubble. I made some money. That's how I got into gold because I'd made some of my own money and other people's money. And I wanted to invest it someplace safe as a insurance policy, as a preservation, not as a speculation asset. We could talk about that too, but my views on the markets and on debt had me pretty concerned years ago. Uh, and my partner, Egon von Greyers was way ahead of the curve with that and mentored me in that. And we can talk about that as well. But basically I saw market risk. I saw banking risk. I saw debt risk and all that led to currency risk and currency risk to me, one of the best hedges for me, it has been physical gold. There are other, uh, other opinions, whether that's digital currencies or, you know, bitcoins and ethereums, or whether that's real estate, different types of real estate, there's different ways to look at the same problem. I just happen to have chosen physical gold as the solution. But, uh, I think the main problem I wore is debt. And, uh, we can talk about why that is and get into that if you'd like. Absolutely. I think, Manju, that's a great place to start. And one of the phrases I love more than any other is, I believe you coined it, I'm not sure, mouse click money. Is that yours? I think I did. I think I did. But <laughs> I, I will take credit for now. But if someone else did at the same time, I, I do think I came up with that. But we'll see. I don't know. I yeah, think well, I'm the first. Yeah. I've been watching so many channels in eight months, getting into the whole financial world and understanding it, and I've never heard it anywhere else. So I think you're pretty safe there. So debt, yeah, 33 trillion approximately, another 60 trillion off balance sheet in the US. Debt is enormous, and they've been printing mouse click money at an incredible rate for a long time now. So maybe just talk through that whole bizarre and dangerous uh, situation. Yeah, I think the best way is kind of start at 30,000 feet and come down into specifics. And, you know, I'll say I was joking or talking about my my youth in America. And I came from this town called Stevensville, Michigan in the Midwest, which was, you know, school Monday through Friday, sports on the Friday, on Saturday, church on Sunday and real kind of conservative, wonderful, great piece of Americana. But in that town was a fellow named David Stockman who became a budget manager for Ronald Reagan. And he was kind of a hero of our town. And years later, he became, I think, one of the one of the most blunt and honest um, speakers about debt and central bank policy to solve debt. His name David Stockman. He wrote a great book that I recommend anyone look at. It's called The Great Deformation. There are some key books that I think are really worth reading. And David Stockman, even when I was in law school or as an undergrad, I, I still was looking at what he was doing and saying. And he got me thinking about debt and he understood debt and these fantasy solutions to the debt. In a lot of ways, it's just like any family or any couple or any common sense group that sits around a table at dinner or at lunch and says, honey, this is what we're making this year. These are our bills. This is what the kids need. These are the expenses. Can we do it or can we not do it? And if we can't do it, do we have to get better jobs, make more income, or do we have to cut some spending? Do we have to sell the Volkswagen or the Porsche or whatever it is to put our kids through school? Do we cancel that vacation to Hilton Head next weekend? Or do we look for better jobs to make more income? In other words, when you're facing basic common sense balance sheets in your own personal life, you either have to make more GDP yourself, you have to produce more, or you have to be uh, spending less. And governments, you'd think, would behave in the same way. Obviously, some leverage, some loans, like mortgages or car loans, are part of life. Some debt is part of life. But when you take that to an extreme of multiples that are beyond rational to abstractions, uh, you have a real problem. I say if you have a busboy salary but a Ferrari appetite, you're going to have a mismatch. That's common sense. And you'd think that would be common sense to the central banks or to the uh inhabitants of the White House, be they left, right, or center, or the budget offices of any uh, administration, you'd think that would be common sense. But the simple truth is, um, when you're a government and you're, at a, you're a president or a senator that wants to get reelected, you need to spend more, you need to have more money available to buy votes, buy popularity, buy uh, a good print, so to speak, in the economy, you can fake it by going into debt. And, and, and Stockman years ago saw this long before COVID or Putin became the excuse for our inflation or our debt problems. He said our country's going into debt at rapid speed. 32, 33 trillion uh, is an abstraction. 
you have to understand that when when Volcker was our Fed chair and not Powell, uh, public debt was under 900 billion. Now we're at 33 trillion. That's a massive amount of debt in a short period of time. But our income, our productivity hasn't grown to the same pace. Uh, whether you measure that by GDP or you measure it by even tax receipts, it's down year over year. So our country, like a family, has a busboy salary, but a Ferrari appetite. And the debt levels that we're at now are, are, are extraordinary. And where it gets weird is when you talk about, well, how does a government get to that much debt? Well, usually because it's to stay elected or to stay popular. Um, and, and, what is, and, and how do we pay for that debt? Well, we, like anyone else, we issue IOUs. Those are called U.S. Treasuries, and we, the world buys those. But lately, the world's buying less of those because we have so many of them that no one trusts our IOUs, just like you wouldn't keep lending to a friend who's constantly borrowing and never paying you back or paying you back at a, at a level that's below what you would need to beat inflation. But the other trick, the most astounding trick, is the Federal Reserve. And again, this is very simple, but if your country's in debt, and there's a lot of IOUs out there that no one wants. Well, how do you how do you pay for that debt or how do you cover that debt? Well, you can literally mouse click that money at a place called the, the Eccles Building on Constitutional Ave at the Federal Reserve. There's a lot of things that are problematic with the Federal Reserve. First, it's neither federal nor reserve. It's an independent private bank. It's not part of the government. It's on Constitution Ave in Washington, D.C., although our Constitution doesn't actually allow a private bank to control the printing or coinage of our money. So there's a lot of problems with the central bank. There's another great book called The Creature from Jekyll Island by e. Edward, Edward Griffin. It's a classic. Again, you have to read it to believe it. Um, and I won't get into all the permutations and, and kind of Tom Clancy-like mechanizations behind the central bank, but it's a beast. It's literally a creature. But that central bank has a, a machine, literally like a computer, like a laptop. It's not a money printer. It doesn't actually print dollars and bills out in the basement. It's just You just mouse click. You need a couple more dollars, just mouse click them. And again, if, if you or I or your family had a machine in the basement where you could go downstairs, log on, your checking account says you have $1,000. But you say, you know what? I'd like a few more zeros on that checking account. Let's make it a hundred thousand. Yeah, let's make it a million. Let's make it ten million. And you could do that legally, expand your money supply legally to cover your debts. You'd be a genius. But that's actually against the law. It's counterfeit. But that's exactly what our central bank does. It literally mouse clicks zeros when it needs more money to pay for its own debt. And so the solution to a debt crisis in America, really since 2008 and the great financial crisis when markets tanked and the two big to fail banks were over their skis and subprime mortgage debt and they collapsed, we bailed them out with taxpayer money and then printed money. In other words, mouse click money. The Fed just expanded its balance sheet and the money supply at extreme levels. So they solved a debt crisis with more debt paid for by money literally created out of thin air. And again, that's a gross simplification of our central bank system in the US, but it's the same with the Bank of Japan, which has done that even on steroids. It's the same with the European Central Bank. It's the same with the Bank of England. It is an independent private bank that creates money out of thin air to cover the debt of its sovereign host. And so it's inherently inflationary if it's overused. It's inherently deformative if it's overused because it distorts everything in the markets. Um, when we had the great financial crisis of 2008 and banks were collapsing and markets were collapsing, when we had the great crisis and the COVID crisis of 2020, when markets were tanking by 36% and would have gone to the ocean's floor, we literally printed trillions of dollars in a matter of months after 2020. And then certainly in 2008, we printed trillions since then to effectively buy back prosperity, buy back the markets, buy back bond support, buy back indirectly through the shadow banking to buy back the stock market because if you can buy back the bonds that keeps the bond market alive if you buy back the us ious that keeps the bond market alive if you buy back those ious that keeps their yields from getting too high and yields have to do with interest rates that gets complicated but it's all about keeping that bond market uncle sam's ious have to be bought to keep the system alive it's that simple and the only one buying them the primary party buying them now is our central bank which again, isn't a government agency. It isn't really part of our government, but it's effectively the fourth branch of government because we have the judicial and the, the, the executive and the legislative, but we have the Fed, which is the fourth branch of government. And it prints money out of nowhere to pay for our own debt. And it creates all kinds of problems, Ivor, all kinds of problems. In particular, it creates currency problems. And, and we should talk about how that's related, but I hope that Again, it's a gross simplification, but we have a central bank that has the power to create money out of nowhere, to monetize the debt 
of our country. And that's the same in the European Union as it is in Japan, as it is in England. And it's an incredibly dangerous little creature that's grown out of control, in my opinion, and is now, frankly, too big to fail and is having more and more power over our lives in ways we can get into. Yep. No, super summary, Matthew. That's that's perfect. And of course, the central banks, just to reiterate yet again, they are private institutions, essentially, from the Bank of England to the Fed to the other central banks. They're all connected together. So I'm sure they have their own desires and their own agendas, in fairness. And they probably keep the governments, their hosts, happy to a point, but also probably pursue their own uh, kind of desires also. Yeah. Well, Henry Kissinger said it, you know, you control the money, you control the world. And who controls the money? The central banks. And Henry Kissinger's got his fingerprints all over all kinds of things. It's important to go back to a watershed moments in, in American history. It certainly is the watershed moment of 1913 when the Fed was signed into law by a very reluctant uh, Woodrow Wilson under tremendous pressure from this cabal of powerful private bankers. But you go to 1971, you see the politics of debt and the politics of the central banks and the politics of gold. So we'll go back to 1971. That's a classic watershed moment. It ties together a lot of these themes of gold, debt, politicians, currencies. But in 1971, you had Richard Nixon, who, like every politician, his main motive was to get reelected. But in 1971, Nixon was looking down the barrel of some bad economic data. He needed to stimulate the economy to get elected. And so he said, we've got this dollar. I need more dollars. But the problem is this dollar is backed by gold. I have to keep a ratio of dollars to gold. I don't have enough gold to create more dollars. So here's a great idea. Let's just remove the gold standard from the dollar. This gold standard was in place since 1944. Let's get rid of it. All the countries that buy our dollars and all the people that buy our dollars who thought it was gold backed, we're going to welch on that now. We're going to do this for the better of the country. We're going to take away the gold standard. And voila, instantly he had all, he, it's like having no chaperone at a party. There was no chaperone on the dollar. He could create as many dollars as he wanted to get reelected, to create better economic news in the short term. And so in 1971, the U.S., dollar was no longer backed by gold. It was backed by the full faith and credit of the U.S. Treasury and the U.S. government. And that government since 1971 has gone into debt, 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 debt at exponential levels. And it's got created more and more and more dollars at exponential levels thanks to the Fed. But what's happened since 1971 is that dollar has lost its power. It's lost its inherent purchasing power when measured against the gold that it used to be supported by. So if you look at a chart, and I can send you one of the US dollar since 1971, it's lost 98% of its purchasing power when measured against a real asset like gold. So when you take away that gold chaperone in 1971, you um, basically have unlimited ability to create money and to inflate your currency and buy really, really good times until that currency becomes so debased and so inflated that it has less and less power. I joke, it's like having a glass of red wine. I live near Bordeaux. If I take a really good glass of Margot and add buckets of water to that glass of wine, it's going to dilute the the taste of that wine while well, adding buckets of central bank created money to the money supply through the Fed dilutes the power of that dollar. It just takes a lot more time. And we're hitting that that road now. So 1971 was a major watershed. Uh, the dollar became unchaperoned from gold. And then every regime since then, and this is where, you know, there's a great history of this by David Stockman, every president left or right gets reelected by creating more and more of those dollars, going more and more into debt, paying for that debt with the help of the central bank, and slowly but surely diluting the currency. People say that's hard to believe because the dollar is still the, the, the best horse in the glue factory. It's still the strongest currency. It's relatively strong, but they're all good patients, what I say in the ICU. They're all inherently weaker. The dollar is just the best of the weak currencies, and there's lots of changes happening there. But that debt and that central bank kind of collided in 1971. Then we had the great financial crisis of 2008, where banks were over their skis in bad debt. They should have failed, but we bailed them out by printing more money. That was called quantitative easing or QE1. And Bernanke, who was the Fed chairman at the time, said, look, this is a special event. It's not the banker's fault. It's just, you know, we got we to gotta sustain these banks. We got to save these banks. Let's print. Let's create a program, give them $800 billion right away, and let's print some money. It'll be very temporary. We'll have no effect on the dollar. By the way, Nixon said that taking the dollar off the gold standard would be temporary. That was 50 years ago. It was not temporary. Bernanke in 2008 said, look, we got to bail out these too big to fill banks, too big to fail banks. It's really important we save them. They're so important to us. Without that, the ATMs will go blank. Everyone will be broke. It'll be a disaster. Got to bail out the banks. It didn't hurt that he had guys like 
Geithner and, and Paulson, who was the former CIO of Goldman Sachs, advising him on this. And so voila, we started printing more money in 2008. We said it would be very temporary. By 2009, 2010, we'd phase it out. Then we had QE2, QE4, QE3, Operation Twist, unlimited QE. In other words, that desire to walk down in the basement and print more money to cover your expenses became an addiction. And so we were printing and printing trillions and trillions of more dollars to support those markets, to bail out those banks. Again, this is a high simplification. We went from 1971 to 2008 through a big, every time there's a crisis, print money, we'll pay for it with, uh, you know, we'll pay, we'll pay, we'll, we'll create some IOUs, we'll print some money to pay for them. Everything will be fine. It won't have an impact on our currency. It'll only make markets better. Yes, when you're printing trillions of dollars, putting that back into the system, and it's complicated, but it goes back into the system. It creates massive asset bubbles. The rise of the bubble post 2008 to today is extraordinary. It's important to remember though, that 10% of the US population benefited from the 90% of that wealth. So in other words, those massive inflation in stocks and bonds created the greatest wealth inequality in our history. That's not by accident. Guys like Bernanke who won a Nobel Prize or Powell say that Fed policy doesn't affect social policy or social. It's absolutely untrue. When you are supporting uh, credit markets and bond markets with money printed out of thin air through policies called quantitative easing, one, two, three, four, operation twist, unlimited QE, you create asset bubbles. And you create bubbles in the credit markets and in the stock markets. The beneficiaries of those are a small minority of Americans. It's the same thing in Europe, and it's the same thing in England. It's the same thing in Japan. A small minority benefits. So not only do the Federal Reserve fake it by printing money to cover debts that are getting bigger and bigger, they create wealth inequality, which creates social unrest. And so the Fed is far more important than just a supporter of our bond market, our sovereign bond market. It has ramifications in our social and political lives as well. But again... Now, if you fast forward to 2023, where we are today, our debt is simply too big. It's too big, but we need more money. Our deficits are getting bigger. We, we're giving out more and more IOUs, but Europeans and foreigners are buying less and less of our IOUs. And so we have to print even more money. We have to, we need more money. But the problem is Powell, our central banker says, well, I'm going to cut back on some of the printing. And in addition, I'm going to raise the cost of that money. I'm going to raise the interest rates. And that's creating a shock effect right now. Because if if foreigners aren't buying it, um, who's going to buy it? And my argument is, this, there's no doubt at the end of the day, Fed, and again, because I know some of your audience is different about hawkish and dovish or tightening and easing. I don't want to use com you know complex words. At the end of the day, I think the power will be forced to print more money, mouse click more money at some point because he needs it to buy our bonds, which no one else is buying. There are the, there are counter theories to that, but I think that's inevitable. We're also heading into recession, so we need to print money to handle to get growth in a recession. We're also competing with China with trade, so we need to weaken the Chinese yuan by uh, weakening. Uh, we need to weaken the U.S. dollar to compete with the yuan and its trade. So there's a lot of reasons I think we're going to get a weaker dollar in the future. It may go up in the interim. But I think we're going to print trillions more to cover our deficits. We're going to print trillions more to get growth in a recession. And we're going to debase our dollar more and more because we have to sustain our debt. And what all that means to your viewers is when you're debasing the currency, when you're diluting the value of that wine, when you're adding water to your currency or your wine, you're weakening it. So it means the money you're making at whatever job you're doing has less and less force behind it. So that is an invisible tax. Again, I'm trying to cover a lot of history, a lot of thoughts, but Mouse click money, currency debasement, and debt are all connected. If that's making some sense to you, Ivor, right now, I want to make sure that makes sense. It gets more complicated when you talk about euro dollar markets or tightening versus easing and the milkshake theory of money coming into the US. There's all kinds of counter theories. But the bottom line is the bottom line is our country's broke, like a broke family. It has very little income, more and more debts. And unlike a broke family, our country can go down in the basement and create money whenever it wants. You and I can't do that. Your viewers can't do that. So we're going to suffer the sins of our central bankers and our politicians who put us into debt and debased our currency to pay for that debt. Yep. No, that's it. Clear as crystal. And I think even for the layperson, and that's the idea. So the layperson now will know from how you described it that the debt has gone off the uh, off the map. Uh, that we're heading for even more debasement, that cash is kind of trash. So any money they have on deposit, obviously with inflation being really high and debasement accelerating probably in the next while, uh, that's not a great place to be. But then if you look at, well, what about pensions and the stock market? 
You know, the stock market should, in, in the light of this macroeconomic reality of everything that's happening in the world, you'd expect the S&P 500 to be kind of continually falling or maybe go off a cliff for a while and recorrect. But I stayed out of the market the last year and a half, which was great for a while. And now I'm watching it with this slight FOMO, FOMO, fear of missing out. And I'm hearing that it may melt up for several months but it's irrational really, and then come down hard. So without financial advice, what's your thoughts on all of this and what's going on with respect to the S&P and the NASDAQ and they're nudging up now? Look, this is a great question. I mean, this was something, again, that David Stockman talked about decades ago and years ago. And he talked about this is the deformation of what happens when you have a central bank that's supporting markets by creating liquidity, by printing money, by supporting the bond markets. Because if the bond markets are safe, the stock markets go higher and higher. And every time we have a, a drawdown or a recession, not even a recession, just a correction, a 10% correction or a 20% drawdown, the Fed will immediately print more money to support those markets. I'm simplifying, but that's what happens. So it's created this moral hazard that Stockman warned about years ago and is still happening today, that the Fed has your back. We call it the Fed put, or it's like this great big airbag that since 2008, 2009, every time the markets go up, there's a little trump, the print goes back up again. Even 2020 with this great COVID crisis, major fall, print trillions of dollars, markets go back up. Nothing from 9-11 to COVID crisis, to wars overseas, to political assassinations, to Fractured society can keep the stock market down as long as the Fed is creating liquidity. And so to your point, this fear of missing out, if you were questioning the Fed or disillusioned by the Fed or cynical about how dangerous the Fed policy is, it doesn't change the fact that markets go up and to the right if the Fed's printing. If the Fed is creating money and keeping rates low, that means the cost of debt is low. That means there's leverage and there's more and more rising markets. And people are saying, like right now, there's this melt up. Don't want to miss it. The problem is, and I've been saying this, I've been bearish for years, and I've missed out on some of those um, melt-ups. But I should joke, I should admit that in 2000, 1998, 1999, 2000, I was in the dot-com bubble, did extremely well on an IPO. I've never been ashamed to admit it. It was dumb luck. It wasn't intelligence. It was a bubble. I got out of that and made a lot of money, and my partner did as well. But we were not smart. We were not chasing good value, good stocks, good balance. We were riding a wave. We were riding a wave. We were riding a bubble. I was smart enough to get out of that bubble, to recognize it as a bubble. But bubbles can make you rich. They can also destroy you overnight. They can. And, and the question I have, so I'm not, I'm not here to poo-poo speculation or to mock the FOMO, the fear of missing out, to mock the psychology of markets, especially when you're younger, you want to get in, you want to take your chances, but keep it, again, simple, stupid. You buy at lows and you sell at tops. It's the most obvious lesson that our grandparents have taught us, our fathers have taught us. No one does it. No one does it. And the Nikkei at crash in 89, it's been, that was almost, God, how many years ago, 1989, that is still not recovered its highs. Still not recovered because everyone was afraid of missing out on that bubble, but it tanked and it didn't V shape right up. But because of the Fed, every time we've had a market correction, it goes back up. So investors think, look, I'm going to just invest. I'm going to chase this market because even if it goes down, it's going to go back up. And that's what your classic 60-40 portfolio a registered investment advisor consensus think I will tell you. Look, invest. The markets always go up. They average 8% a year. That's what Jeremy Siegel said. Just get in the markets. When they go down, don't worry. They'll bounce back up. The Fed has your back, et cetera, et cetera. So I understand the desire to chase a market, even as a market that's at all-time highs or reaching all-time highs, despite all these fundamental problems in the macros with debt levels being ridiculous, with IOUs and treasuries not being loved and central banks supporting them. You're saying, Matt, I don't care. That's macros. I'm just going to chase this market. I'm going to chase the speculative top. I'm going to make some money. Almost no one does because they always get strung out. They always get pushed down. But the Fed, as David Stockman warned, distorts supply and demand. It's, it's, it distorts free market price discovery, and it gives you the sense that you'll be safe there because the Fed has your back. There's this airbag. And what I'm saying now, and it's my opinion, it's, I, I don't think I'm alone, Ray Dalio, Druckenmuller, other hedge fund managers, not just gold bulls like myself, be very, very careful of making that assumption, especially under the current regime. You can only print for so long before you kill the currency. You can only keep supporting falling markets for so long before you distort the markets. And I think Powell, I have written essays and essays against Powell. The one positive thing I can say about Powell is he's trying to take some of that easy money, some of that mouse click money out of the system and markets are going to go down. He wants to engineer a recession to fight inflation. 
But I don't think even if Powell uh, saw a falling market, he'll do what all central bankers are probably do. He'll print more money again. He'll go from tightening to easing. He'll reduce rates to try and support the markets. But I think the difference this time is that um, we've printed too much. We've supported it for too long. We need what the, the Austrians call constructive destruction. You need good capitalism needs to have a cleanse, so to speak, a financial enema. You've got to get these bad credits, these bad balance sheets, these bad stocks out of the system. We've avoided that for the last many, many years since 2008 by just supporting everything and all stocks and bonds go up on rising QE tides. I think this next crisis, because of the level of debt we have in America and in the world, because it's grown exponentially, we have three times more debt than we have income globally. The next time the markets crash, QE won't have the same effect. And the analogy, again, I use it analogies because they work when you don't know markets. That's fine. No one has to know everything about markets. But it's like having lots of martinis at a frat party or lots of beer. If you want the party to go on all weekend, just keep drinking. Don't stop because if you stop, you're going to start to feel the queasies. But if you take the Bloody Mary, a couple beers, you know, time it carefully, you can keep that party going. But I'm sorry what happens no matter how long the party, how good the party, you're going to get the hangover. And at some point, that hangover is going to be painful. And the more you drink, the more painful that hangover. And I'm saying the more we postpone through quantitative easing, money printing, yield suppression, interest rate suppression, the worse that hangover is going to be. And now Powell, after years of Fed central bank martini drinking, is trying to take away that, that martini, he's trying to take away that punch bowl. And that's creating all kinds of problems. It's, it's killing the treasury market. That means the price of treasuries are going down. And the banks use treasuries as collateral for their balance sheet. So it's killing small banks like Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic, all those headline banks we saw in March and April of this year. It's, it's killing the U.S. Treasury market, and it will eventually kill the stock market. And the only reason, in my opinion, the stock market is still inching on hope right now is the stock market believes that things are so bad that the Fed will have to print more money to support these markets. And so in this distorted central bank, distorted death of capitalism, which stock won't agree, Bad news is good news. Bad news means we can just wait for Uncle Fed to print some more money for his spoiled nephews and nieces on Wall Street so we can just get more money. And I'm saying making that assumption year after year, at some point, um, at some point it's not going to work. But that could be argued that, Matt, you're just the boy who cried wolf. You're always saying QE is not going to work. At some point, the system's going to collapse. But you've missed out on all these spikes, and they'd be right. Because I've been bearish since 2016, 2017. This central bank supported market is a cancer, in my opinion. It's a lot of fun. Ernest Hemingway called it whenever a country is in debt, you have temporary prosperity and then permanent ruin by deflating the currency. And that's exactly what we have. He also said we'd have war. And what we've had really is a lot of temporary prosperity, a lot of bull bubble markets. But now we have permanent war all the time in our country. We're always at war somewhere in the name of freedom and democracy. Uh, we're now debasing the currency and we have inflation, which Powell said would be temporary, but we said years ago it was going to be sticky. And, uh, you know, we have we have inflation, debasement, war, and um, I think what Hemingway called permanent ruin coming. And that sounds very sensational, very dramatic, very clickbaity. But it's not just me, a gold guy in Switzerland who got lucky on the dot-com bubble in the 90s. Um, uh, it's 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 very important, blunt speaking, honest Hedge fund managers, former bankers, reformed speakers, who I think now, even guys like Ray Dalio, who certainly doesn't need the money, is and certainly benefited from a central bank driven uh, equity market, is saying this is bad because the debt is so bad, the currency is so threatened, and our politics are so fractured. And our policies uh, are really cornered because if, if, if Powell continues to raise rates and take away the punch bowl, that kills the economy. If the then he beats inflation by killing the economy, but that's like you know that's a pyrrhic victory. Okay, I beat inflation. You know, like Napoleon wanted to go to Moscow. Okay, he got to Moscow, but his whole army died. So we can beat inflation, but we destroy our economy. The flip side is we can save the economy and save the 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 bond market by printing more money, and that kills the currency. So it's either the economy or the currency. I hope that makes more sense. It's either the economy or the currency. And throughout history, throughout history. Currency is always the last bubble to pop. It's the last thing to give. And I think that's what's going to happen. We're going to save the system. We could technically print enough money to keep the markets from ever going down. But to do that, we're killing the currency. And that, frankly, is, I think, the end game here. It doesn't sound like it. No one will say it at the Fed. They won't say it at the FOMC, at the Brookings Institute or Jackson Hole. No one will say it. But the only tool they have left to save this system is 
base rent even more. And that's an inf- that's death by inflation. That's the invisible tax that we're feeling now, that we're feeling now. And mm. I'll say one more thing, and I'll end it on this theme. This is something I've said over and over. It's a monologue, but when debt gets too big throughout history, from ancient Rome to, to the French Revolution, to Yugoslavia in the 90s, to Weimar in the 30s, to South America at any given crisis, every debt-soaked nation or empire throughout history, I'm talking throughout history, without exception, debt always leads to a financial crisis, which then leads to a currency crisis, which then leads to social unrest. And from that social unrest, you get extreme political control from the left or the right. And that's the biggest threat of all right now, is that extreme political control when you've got a debt-soaked nation with its back against the wall to keep that social unrest from just becoming pitchforks, you have to control. And that, I think, is the real symptom of our debt scenario today. We're seeing control and everything from a surveillance society, from Microsoft to Google to Amazon to YouTube to LinkedIn. We're seeing it in the mandates. We're seeing it in the central bank digital currencies. More and more ways to control in the name of national security or your good. That's a very debatable, very complex issue. It can go into a million different directions. But that that syllogism from debt to control and in the interim inflation and war is repeated throughout history. And that's not sensational. That's not clickbait. That's what we're actually experiencing. It's not even theoretical because we're seeing it right now playing out in real time. Whatever your politics, left or right or center, we can't deny that our society is fractured. The problem from the media is pretty consistent. That There's clear censorship, whatever your views on it, whether it's your views on the war, on central bank digital currency, the war in Ukraine, Zelensky, good or bad, Putin, good or bad. It's a very truncated message. It's a very controlled message. In a society like the West and the U.S. in particular, I never thought we'd see levels of censorship and control in the name of public security like we're seeing today. Whether it's the Patriot Act or whether it's central bank digital currency or the Fed now or whether it's, hey, this isn't good enough for YouTube. What you just said is not right. In an open society, whether you want to talk about Martians causing COVID or whether you want to talk about a lab leak causing COVID, in an open society, you should be able to say that. And in an open society, you should be able to be critical of your government or your central bankers without being seen a threat to security. And the fact that we're seeing more and more canceled cultural, historical, scientific theories is a warning sign of that control. And again, you can use the recent pandemic as an example without taking sides. But when you have folks at Great Barrington, thousands of doctors and scientists with one opinion, and then the head of a CDC or the head of a government agency having one opinion, and that government power ignores all those other opinions without any kind of public debate, you know there's a problem. Again, regardless of your views on the jab or anything else, and that can be true of foreign policy, that can be true of monetary policy, it can be true of health policy. Um, That's a problem. And again, this goes to my other theme here, debt creates currency destruction. It also creates destruction of certain liberties and freedoms. And this isn't sensational. Look it up. Look at every watershed moment in history, whether it was Lenin, Mao, whether it was Nixon, whether it was going off the dollar sign, whether it was Franco in Spain, Mussolini in Italy, or Hitler in Germany. They all take advantage of inflation to gain power and then take control to to solve an inflation problem. And it's fascinating, this relationship between inflation, currency debasement, and political control, which affects all of our daily lives, not just our checking accounts with that invisible tax of inflation. It literally affects our choices, whether it's traveling, arguing, thinking. Whatever your arguments, whatever your views, they should be free. And the fact that they're not, that's a problem. So you see that money and debt and finances and markets are more than just catching tops and bottoms or getting rich quick or taking care of risk. It actually affects our political and social infrastructure in in, in manifold ways. Yeah. For sure, Matthew. And you know what? It may underpin most of the major social change, as many people have commented. The whole COVID overreaction response could have been intimately connected to the whole financial problems we discussed. And again, the central bankers across the world and a lot of other players like the Kissingers of today have huge influence. And this is too big to fail. It's enormous. It's the end of an era. I think Dalio, actually, I didn't know that guy. But he put out an animated 40-minute thing on YouTube, and it's 36 million views very quickly. It's quite good. It shows the the repetitive nature, as you described. Yeah. And... The um, And just circling back then, so people's personal finance in this maelstrom of madness, uh, which is as you describe, uh, 
the market then timing wise timing is always the killer because as you say you're a long-term bear since 16 uh, and rightly so but but there becomes a point you're correct so it's very hard to call uh, whether you should get out now i'm going to stay out for a little while and watch i'm going to resist the fomo because the worst thing you can do is get emotional and jump in <laughs> right at the wrong moment yeah i'd prefer an opportunity cost than that and i'm going to watch but like timing the way the world is going the cbdc's are quickening now we can see that the drum beats coming up which means a crisis will probably be needed to get them through What's your thoughts on the timing of the curve in the coming 12 months? No, it's an important question. There's not one right answer because there's different types no. of investors. So it really depends. So I'll try and give three or four answers because it depends on the listener. Some listeners are younger, some are older, some are richer, some are poorer. Some have the ability to take risks, some don't. Um, a lot of what, what you're saying is true. I mean, I think there's a lot of arguments to be made that the Fed needs for tax receipts to keep the markets alive longer and higher. So don't worry. You could make a similar argument. No, the systems are going to crack under their own debt weight. So wait for the markets to implode and buy at the bottom. As Rothschild said, I hate to quote Rothschild. I think he's awful, but you buy when there's blood in the streets, right? So I want to, I want to back up and look at that question from different perspectives. Um, my daughter, for example, is at Goldman Sachs doing pretty well. And they match her 401k. And she asked me for financial advice. I say, it's very simple, honey. Just wait for the markets to tank because you're only 28. And when they tank, you'll never know exactly what the bottom is, but you'll know it's near a bottom because we're not close to that right now. She's 28. She has some money. She can wait. She can wait with dry powder on the side, even though there's inflation killing that dry powder. I get it. But she can wait because she's young and she can afford to take some risk and she can wait for blood in the streets. I hate to say it and then buy at a bottom, a generational opportunity to buy at a bottom. Many will say, but Matt, what if there is no bottom? What if the Fed just keeps that Fed put, that airbag, and we're missing out every day? I think that's a fair point, but I do believe in the one key rule of even distorted markets, and these are distorted markets, completely Fed distorted, but all markets revert to their mean. And by that, I mean, if you think of a rubber band on your finger, you pull it up or down, it always springs back to the finger. A market that goes too high from that finger eventually springs to its mean. We are so far from the mean that this S&P, Dow, and NASDAQ have a long way down to go to their mean reversion moment, and every market mean reverts. It will be a brutal mean reversion. So I think younger investors can afford to wait. They want to speculate in in digital currencies. I get it. I get it. I was a speculator. That's how I made my lucky money. So I can't poo-poo speculation. If you could take the risk, do it. But my advice to, to people that can afford to be patient is be patient because these markets are going to go much lower. They may go higher. All melt-ups are, you know, all meltdowns are preceded by meltups. If you look at the technicals, that's typical. If you can time that, no one can. Very, very few people can. My advice is if you're young, just wait for blood in the street, so to speak. Wait for these markets to really hit the fan. You won't know exactly when to get in, but you're buying at the top right now. I'm against that. But I've been against that for years. So I've missed out on a lot of dips and buys. I'll be candid. Other people that are older, that are in their 70s, like say you were a 70-year-old Japanese citizen in 1989, and the big quote in Tokyo in 89 was, how can we get hurt if everyone's crossing the street at the same time? We're all safe. This is a safe market. It's the sun that never sets. It's Japan. Well, that Nikkei lost 80% in a matter of months. And if you were 70-year-old and you didn't get out of that top, well, you never got your money back. It, you never recovered. There was no V-shaped instant QE that saved you, even with all the QE that Tokyo has done. So depending on your age, if you're, if you're at a point now where you're looking at your 401k and you're at a retirement level, you've gotten pretty good tailwind for the last 15 years. You may want to start thinking about getting out of that market, in my opinion. The risk is so much worse than the so much higher than the reward that if we have a 30, 40, 50 percent correction in the markets, which is totally natural, even if the Fed prints more money to try and save it, you can't afford that kind of pain, that kind of volatility, that kind of stress. So there's a difference between whether you're younger or older, whether you have a bottom or top mentality, whether you're a speculator or an investor. Many people in their 50s or 60s are more in my, like me thinking more about wealth preservation, you know, a return of their money, not a return on their money, just get it back or to preserve the purchasing power. In that regard, I look at assets like precious metals because I just want to preserve the purchasing power of my money. I'm an investor. I'm not a speculator. So I'm just trying to preserve my wealth. That's a very different investment cycle. That's a very different conversation. Precious metals, commodities agricultural land, you know, et cetera. Not just real estate in general, but certain kinds of real estate. So that's the preservation thinking. Speculation thinking is very different depending on how old you are. Um, 
even if you're a speculator though, I'm a value investor as a speculator. I wait for things to have good balance sheets, good PE multiples, good pricing. It's very hard to find good pricing in a bubble. And whether you, you're bull or bear, you have to admit this is a bubble. The question is, in my opinion, the markets are no longer driven by natural supply and demand balance sheets, leading indicators. They're driven by Fed policy. And that in and of itself is an aberration. It's appalling that capitalism and speculating and the stock market, the number one signal everyone looks to right now is what's the Fed going to do? Is it going to raise rates? That means markets go down. Is it going to cut rates? That means market goes up. The Fed decides the market. So you have to front run the Fed. You have to predict Fed policy to be an investor today. Of course, if you're very, very trained technical investor who looks at Keltner bands, Bollinger bands, and DMARC indicators and has stop losses and you're brokering calling three times a day and you have your own Bloomberg and you're a professional trader, you can play volatility just on Tesla and make a living. But for most people, they're not that way. And if you're not a professional trader, and I'm not anymore, don't toe dip into that minefield. Use your common sense. We're at a top, not the top maybe, but we're at a top. Can you afford a 30, 40% drawdown? If you can, fine, speculate away. If you can't, take some cash out now, uh, put it in you know, short duration treasuries, get some yield. You're still not going to beat inflation, but it's better than getting a 30, 40% drawdown, which I do see coming. And nobody, including Ray Dalio, myself, Druckenmuller, anyone knows when. Nobody knows. The biggest risks yeah. in markets are timing, uh, leverage. I think, yeah, it, really timing and leverage are major risks, but no one can time a market. And even the best technical guys, they can time certain trends. Um, but it's very hard. The things that brought down markets are never what you expected and no one knows. And there's a lot of risk out there right now, you know, yeah. but I do think it depends on your wealth, your age and your, your tolerance for volatility. Yep. And you know what, it, whether the younger, the older, or even yourself, as you described yourself, putting a fair chunk into short term treasuries and indeed gold, uh, physical metal is not a bad hedge, you know, maybe not huge percentages, but you could leave a certain amount in the market. Ideally, you're targeting, you know, value investment in your in your portfolio and, you know, reasonable PE ratios or whatever, or you know the management of a company, or you know the strategies in the future or commodities. But like gold, gold, I'm not a gold bug, but I've I've hedged with gold in the way that you described. Um, that springs to mind, Matthew, actually, a couple of things in my mind. One is, in 2019, I found out, and it wasn't in the financial press, that for a long, long time, you'll know how long, I don't, the US sovereign debt or dollar was the class one, um, or, yeah, class one asset, I think, the only top class asset with the worldwide central banks and the Bank of International Settlements and all those kind of guys up the top. And then in 19, they moved gold from, I think, 2B or something, well down, right up to sit in class one. What, why did they do that? Uh, thoughts? So many things. First of all, I, I finish one question, go to this question on gold, because the one thing I will say about the investments, that 2% or the two-year, the, you know, the short duration treasuries, a lot of hedge funds right now are sitting in two-year treasuries, getting some yield on that. Not mm. because they're... Um, looking for that great yield, although it's better than on the 10 or longer term treasuries, they're sitting there losing money intentionally to inflation because they're waiting for markets to tank. They're just waiting. That's just something to keep in mind. The smart money, a lot of the smart money, and I talked to a lot of hedge fund managers, the smart money is willing to lose a little to inflation right now to wait for an event. And again, they're generational events, but then they come in and buy. So that's just the end of that last segment on what to think about when some of the if you're some of your listeners are thinking, what are the hedge fund guys doing? A lot of them are sitting on short duration treasuries, waiting for a market to puke to buy low, not at the total bottom, but to buy lower than this. To your other question about the U.S. dollar and gold and tier one status and the Bank of International Settlements and these different Basel Accords and, and new rules and repricing gold or recalibrating gold, I think without getting all the complexity, it's very simple. Somewhere in the last few years, and certainly right now, what we're seeing in the last year is central banks are buying more gold and dumping more dollars. And that's just keep it simple, stupid. The big banks of the world, especially as you go east in, in the BRICS countries, are getting rid of treasuries 
And that means they're getting rid of dollars. They're getting rid of Uncle Sam's IOUs because Uncle Sam has been at that bar stool for too long. His bar tab has gotten too big and nobody wants his IOUs. So they're repricing the dollar. They're rethinking the dollar in Uncle Sam's treasury and they're rethinking gold. And it's not a coincidence that as they're dumping treasuries, they're buying gold because they're thinking three or four moves ahead. The fun is no longer going to be in the markets or in the dollar. The, the, the reality is going to be in real real assets with real purchasing power. And again, I have a bias. I'm a gold executive in Zurich. It's not just a bias. It's a conviction, but I could be selling my book and that's, you got to disclose that, but I do believe this. But what I'm saying is it's like, again, trying to keep this simple. Think of the story. We all know of the three little pigs. It's an American parable or fable about there's two pigs that have so much fun. They're building their house out of straw and the other one's building his house out of mud and they're going out partying every night and they're having a great time. They're playing the markets. They're playing the the nightclubs, you know, dating the right girls, whatever. Those two pigs are having a great time with their little straw and mud house. And there's this boring pig who's building his house out of brick because he heard that somewhere there's a big bad wolf coming. And the analogy is if I build my house out of bricks, when that big bad wolf comes, he can huff and puff, but he won't blow my house down. And in a way, speculation right now at a market top is like being that little piggy with the straw house or the mud house, that temporary prosperity that Hemingway talked about, that euphoria where, hey, man, markets are up. Fed has our back. This is our time to speculate. I'm going to be the little pig with the straw house. It's going to have fun. And what, what I'm saying is I do believe it's my opinion, like Ray Dalio's opinion and David Stockman's opinion, and God knows how many others out there. There's so many on those Kitco's and those wealthy ones that agree. That big bad wolf is coming. It's called a debt crisis. It's called a currency crisis. And the pig who has the house made out of bricks is going to beat the big bad wolf. The other little piggies with the straw houses, with those risk portfolios and those speculative assets are going to get eaten alive by that big bad wolf, that credit crisis, that crunch. In some ways, you could say Silicon Valley Bank was a pig with a straw house. JP Morgan is a pig with a brick house. It has more gold and it has more deposits. But whether you're JP Morgan or Silicon Valley Bank or a tech millionaire or you're waiting tables trying to invest in the markets right now, use your common sense. There's more risk coming to you than there is reward. There is a big bad wolf called a credit crisis, a credit contraction, a debt induced event coming. I do not know when it is. Nobody does. The signs are obvious. The shark fins are rising. The, the central bankers are more and more cornered, more and more desperate. That's why we see more political control. We see more problem, more phraseology, more platitudes, but really bad math. But I think that big bad wolf is coming. So regardless of what your profile is, I think build your house out of brick. That goes to my argument about gold. Again, I'm a gold guy, not a crypto guy. I'm not going to make fun of cryptos. I think gold is that brick house. It's not going to make you rich overnight. I do think the price of gold will do incredibly well over the many years to come with volatility. Nothing goes straight up. I think gold is an incredibly good asset, even just on price appreciation. But for me and for many others, and we have clients from other 90 countries and our minimums are very high, so they're pretty smart people. They're just interested in having a brick house when that big bad wolf comes. And to them, that's what gold is. It goes back to my point. Gold is just currency insurance for dying currencies. And I'm a landlord because I charge you rent to keep that gold someplace very safe. And why is that to be someplace very safe? Because the world isn't safe anymore. There's confiscation, there's tax, there's there's inflation, there's splintered politics. There's a lot of reasons to be worried about keeping that gold under your mattress, which was normally what I would do, but I wouldn't do it today. It's too dangerous. And so there's a lot of reasons to think like the pig with the brick house versus the pig with the straw house. Um, but I, I have to admit, I was the pig with the straw house. It paid well in the late nineties during a dot-com bubble. It made me money, but I had to think more like a pig with a brick house. Once you have some money than a pig with a straw house, when you're trying to make money. So I get there's different types of listeners thinking different types of things. I don't make fun of speculators. I just warn them of the risk. They should know the risk. That's why they're speculators. But if you're an investor, mm -hmm. you look for value. There's very little value to market top. If you're older and you're looking for preservation, you look for real assets that have infinite duration and a limited supply, and that's precious metals. And believe me, the number of sophisticated investors we see from all over the world who otherwise know stocks and bonds or even cryptos are putting a lot of money into physical gold right now. It just is what it is. Now, we could all be wrong, but I don't think it's a coincidence that even central banks are stacking gold, not Bitcoin. And again, it's not to make fun of Bitcoin. I'd love to see my Bitcoin friends make even more money, all power too, because the intellectual argument behind Bitcoins, it's an alternative to fiat money, which I despise because it's backed by nothing. So I don't, I'm not here to make fun of Bitcoin at all. I have no horse in that race and nothing against it. I just have chosen physical gold. It's less sexy. It's a little more boring, a lot less volatile, 
but I think it holds its pers- its, per- its wealth preservation capacity far better than cryptos right now. Mm. Excellent. Yeah, no, and that's that's exactly a, as I view it, but because I've been watching you and people like you for, for a long time, getting all the data, getting all the all the actual the technology. Because, you know, if you're if you have a technical bent, you can watch all the experts and you can use your judgment to choose among them, be unbiased, and just move where the data indicates, exactly as you've said, Matthew. And you know, BRICS there, that, that's a great little pun there, because of course the BRICS countries are stocking up in gold. And I'll put it on the screen now, I'm sure you've seen it, but that really funny cartoon where Uncle Sam is throwing uh, gold bricks over the tennis net, and the BRICS countries are throwing dollars back. It's like, who's the asshole? Who's the idiot? <laughs> No, it's fascinating. Then this BRICS de-dollarization thing, it's very complex. It's very strong and good opinions on both sides. But there's, it's undeniable that the BRICS, their collective GDP is now uh, ahead of the G7 GDP. Their population size, their landmass side, their, their collection of natural resources, they're banding together for a reason. Not because they're all so close and trust each other, but they have a common enemy in the U.S. dollar, which the U.S. dollar was weaponized against a major power like Putin. They saw that and they said, not on my watch. I don't want to be in that currency. I don't want to be in that trading settlement. I don't want to be in that system because they can take it away from me like they did to Putin. Whatever you think of Putin, I'm not here to take a stance on that. But the rest of the world said, we don't want to be bullied by a weaponized world reserve currency. We've got all our own natural resources. We've got all these things. Let's come together, as they're going to do in a couple months in South Africa, and let's basket our assets and our currencies, and let's back it by something. I'm going to be quite certain that's going to be partially backed by gold. Again, not the end of the U.S. dollars, world reserve currency, not the BRICS suddenly ruling the world, not gold going to 10000 on September 1st. It just means the world is shifting away from the dollar. They're shifting towards physical gold because it's the one thing they trust the Indians and the rupee don't trust the real and the Brazilians. They certainly trust gold somewhere in the middle. And that's the simple fact of the matter. And the Russians, their finance ministers, Glasia, Bobokov, they're coming up with settlements that are backed by gold. Not because they're gold bugs, because that's the only thing that people trust. It's the only other countries trust, because they don't trust Uncle Sam anymore. We're a long way away from Iwo Jima and the flag and those wonderful images of Babe Ruth. And I love America. I love the cornfields outside my baseball diamond. I love growing up in Michigan. It's not the same country I grew up in 40 years ago. It just isn't. We're broke. We're a broke family. We are a broke family with a lot of great nostalgia. I think America can still be a great country. It still is a great country, but we're broke. And we're going to have to suffer some austerity, some market shifts, some debasement in our currency, some temporary ruin, hopefully not permanent ruin, as Hemingway said. But we have to be realistic about that. That's not being anti-American or pro-Swiss or pro-European. The same things are happening in Europe too. The same trends, the debt, the debasement of the currency, the dishonesty from our politicians, the nefarious kind of gray matter that is the central banks and what's their real motive. All of this is, is creepy stuff. And none of us know all the answers from Davos to the BIS really knows who's the trigger pullers and what their ultimate motives are. But they're generally not for the mass majority of people. The vast majority of people are the plankton. They are the plankton for these banking whales, as I've said many times. And so prepare yourself. You want to prepare by speculating, taking risks. You want to prepare by owning gold. You want to prepare by trying to try Bitcoin or whatever. That's up to each of you to get informed. Definitely don't just take my opinion. I've always said, question everything I say, question everything Dalio says, Druckenmiller, whether you're watching Wealthy on a Kidco, get different views. I have a strong bias. I think it's an informed bias, and that's what makes my opinion somewhat valuable, but it's still an opinion. It's a conviction. Um, but I find more and more people that I know in the hedge fund space, in the precious metal space, in the commodity space, we all have pretty much the same opinions right now This in our non consensus contrarian think tank world we're all pretty much seeing the same things we're seeing the slow decline of the dollar we're seeing debasement of the currency we're seeing sticky inflation we're seeing social unrest we're seeing more centralization and we're seeing precious metals not as a solution to all of those things but as one solution to the the death of your currency which you know from jim rickards to dalio to me to Druckenmiller to hedge fund x y or z they all see it they all see it and so it's worth thinking about and hopefully not too complicated it gets complicated Oh, absolutely. No, you're doing a great job, Matthew, I must say, of, of skirting away from getting into the weeds of the detail because you don't need it. Uh, you just you need exactly what you're giving. And, you know, that is superbly uh, kind of reassuring that all of these really hard edged, hardcore guys are pretty much uh, in consensus. Now, I know 
I know sometimes people try to push a consensus and it's the opposite of truth, but in this case, it's a healthy, open, free market, free speech consensus of experts. So that's super. And I'm really conscious of your time, but I, I would like to finish off with, with one rant from you, if you will. I, I don't mean that in a, in a derogatory sense, a good old rant. And that's on the CBDCs, the central bank digital currencies, because you know, my view and, and recent interview with Professor Werner and others, and I'm guessing yourself broadly, this is a central bank uh, jump for power, power and control. And, and it's very sinister. So maybe just riff on that. No, your interview with Werner was fascinating, by the way. It was excellent. And he's a fascinating individual. I'd love to, to, to meet him separately. Um, central bank digital currency, in a nutshell, is a Trojan horse. It's... Um, it's 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 a pig and lipstick in a sense. It, it's being touted as some wonderful solution to avoid banking risks, like we saw at Silicon Valley, to avoid to avoid FDIC bailouts, like we saw all these bank failures, to give you better interest rates, to compete with even you can be like Jamie Dimon, you get the same Fed funds rate return, will give you better rates, better access to capital, your deposits will be a liability on the Fed's balance sheet, and it'll be great. You'll have no risk because the Fed can never fail and will be the ultimate bank of banks and your money will be safe. And it's a great trading system. It's, a, it's an efficient payment system. They'll talk about this over and over from the BIS to the Fed to the IMF. They've all have different narratives and different versions of these currencies that are not as yet. And because it's very important, like the Fed now is like basically a digital SDR. It's for banks to give money to each other among banks. The, uh, the BIS has, I think, a thing called the icebreaker, and the IMF has another thing called the universal monetary unit. They're all digital dollars, yens, wands, et cetera, that banks can use to, to do lot swaps and loans and, and liquefy each other. When it gets dangerous is when you have a central bank digital currency in which your checking account is, is an actual, your asset, your checking account is a liability of the Federal Reserve, the central bank of your home nation. That's dangerous. Again, better interest, safer counterparty risk because your money's at the Fed. But what they're not telling you is it's a ledger system like a Visa or a MasterCard. It's not even blockchain. It's just a decent, it's a centralized ledger system, which means like a Visa, a MasterCard, or American Express, they can cancel whenever they decide that your social score or your last YouTube video or your last opinion didn't, didn't go well. And so you have to be very careful. This is why I talked about this move from debt to, to social unrest, to political control, to centralization. This isn't a fairy tale. It's throughout history. And this is the common symptom of that type of control. Central bank digital currency is not about efficient payment systems to help you, John and Jane Doe, get better interest rates and safer counterparty risk at your banks and faster efficiencies. You know, when Fed, when the Fed talked about this last year, Powell said, we're not going to replace cash. We're going to respect privacy. Okay, that's great this year. What about next year or three years from now? Remember, Nixon told you that going up to gold standard was going to be temporary. Bernanke said there'd be no consequence to QE1. They also said it'd be temporary. Powell just told you that inflation was going to be transitory. Their record for telling you the truth and their way of Trojan horsing, terribly controlling, centralizing powers under the, under the guise of something beneficial, like no counterparty risk, faster settlement, higher pay, payment efficiencies, is notorious. Why should you trust that? And I think what's good now is guys like George Gammon and guys like your, and your interview with Werner, Americans and Europeans, people that listen and are trying to get more informed and not just emotional about money or politics or transgender or COVID or Putin, people are just trying to get informed about CBDC. They're not going to swallow this pill as easily now because folks like you are getting this message out. I don't know anyone who can make a straight face argument for CBDC is good for the society. It's definitely a more efficient payment system. That I can't argue with. You know, nuclear weapons are more efficient than a than a than a musket at the, the Battle of Manassas or Bull Run. But I'd rather go to war with, you know, Bull Run than go through Hiroshima. In other words, yes, it's more efficient, and yes, artificial intelligence is probably more intelligent than you and I by billions. But be careful what you ask for. This CBDC is an absolute slow drip towards more and more control over your personal life, your financial life. And you see politicians now like Nigel Farrar having their bank account shut down. What, 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 what's going on? But that'll be a lot easier in a centralized world where everything you do, like your visa card is, is on the balance sheet of a central bank, a central bank that is not part of our government. It's a private bank that has more control over your lives than your Congress. 
I mean, you yeah. just got to think of it this way. It is, I can't underestimate or overstate enough how bad central bank digital currency is and how, in my opinion, how dishonest the narrative is. And I'll just say one thing in 2020, at the height of the COVID hysteria, when they were using COVID as the ultimate pretext for the biggest bailout since 2008, because that was a bond bailout in addition to a PPL check or a STEMI check, there was a back of the curtains bail out of the US bond market, but that's another story. But the IMF already in 2020 was telegraphing, anchoring central bank digital currency as a necessary solution to the debt crisis. And they were blaming the debt crisis in 2020 on COVID and on, and it was now they're dealing on Putin, but that debt crisis was there long before COVID. And they were comparing COVID to World War II when 85 million plus Americans, Europeans, Asians, were eradicated from the earth when Rotterdam, Dresden was on fire, when my backyard was occupied, occupied by the Nazis. In other words, to compare COVID to World War II was an insult at every level to our human experience. But they tried. And then they said, like COVID and like World War II, we need a Bretton Woods 2.0. We need a new solution to this debt crisis. Bretton Woods is when we had a gold-backed dollar. For them, the answer was central bank digital currency. In other words, they were taking advantage of a crisis, whether that was coincidental, man-made, or just uh, taking advantage of an opportunity. Very debatable. They have a crisis, whether it was created or coincidental. They use that crisis to then gaslight us into thinking central bank digital currency will help as the solution. So you have a man-made problem with a man-made solution that are both fake. And central bank digital currency, in my opinion, is extremely dangerous to our liberties beyond just financial transparency and better payment systems. And I, I hope people think their liberties are just as valuable as their checking accounts. I think we should be able to have both in our country, in our world. We should have liberties to speak, debate, argue, and we should have checking accounts that are private and safe and, and, and insured. But I don't think we need central bank digital currency to decide that for us. And I think it's a very dangerous thing. And I don't think it can be discussed enough. And I think the more we discuss it, the less, the less possible it'll be. But Maybe I'm naive on that ground. I don't know, but I hate it. No. I hate central bank digital currency. <laughs> I'll be blunt. <laughs> I yeah. think you made that quite clear, Matthew. Thank you. Yeah, um, but yeah, no awareness. It's not naive, actually. Awareness is the only thing really we have. And people often say, "Well, we can all try and go away from where they want to go. Local supply, local community, local barter, whatever gold, yada yada yada. That's fine for you, but it's not going to change." where it's going so awareness i think is the only shot whether it works or not awareness and to your earlier i love that one the whales and the plankton you know don't be a plankton get informed understand help others to understand and elevate the plankton class and you know then you can fight back against the whale but otherwise forget it most people are sleepwalking and the media obviously is atrocious. But here, any last thoughts? Because I'm again, I'm conscious of your time. I know you have to wrap it up, but uh, just maybe a last comment overall or last thought and, and we'll wrap. Yeah, I think there's a great, I do believe in exceptional moments in time that are often crises and opportunities. I think awareness, being informed, that doesn't mean parroting your view or my view or anyone else's, but really digging a little bit look around, listen to arguments that you agree with, and even the ones you disagree with, that's just as important. I think what we need, I'll keep saying this, is more informed debate, not emotional debate, not just the kind that makes you popular. If you say the right few phrases that you're going to be instantly popular, that works, but that's not really courageous. That doesn't mean it to be a contrarian for contrarian's sake, but really, come on, get 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 informed. With, with markets, that's a lot easier than with other social justice issues that are more maybe emotional. But with markets, economies, central banks, central bank digital currencies, it's not too hard to get informed. And there's something John Kennedy said, who I think was a courageous politician with a profile in courage, who actually thought more about his country than his reelection, say like Nixon. Uh, I think guys like RFK Jr. actually have profiles in courage. They don't need the money or the fame. They actually are worried about their country. But as Kennedy said years ago, there's something immoral about abandoning your own judgment. And I think people need to create their own judgment by informing that judgment. And if you do that for yourself, you'll, it'll help you stay sane in these insane times, whether they're market, whether it's politics, geopolitics, BRICS versus the, the Don BRICS, Putin versus Zelensky, Powell versus us, get more informed and, and trust your own judgment. Don't trust mine. My judgment is based on a lot of bias, but a lot of books and a lot of experience, but it's just one opinion. But get Get informed and trust your own judgment. That's my my final rant or advice on this theme. 
That is just perfect. Uh, Matthew Piepenberg, this has been an absolute pleasure. I love finishing with the Kennedys. I have a huge admiration for that clan. Uh, I may have an Irish bias. You might have an Irish bias, yeah. (laughs) Maybe just a little, but no. Um, Principled. Principled and ethical. That's Nowadays, that seems to be gone. We need to bring it back. So thanks so much, Matthew. And we'll circle back again maybe in a while and see how it's going. Great, Ivar. It was a real, real pleasure talking with you today. I hope and trust that you found that informative and indeed entertaining. Matthew is a treasure. Uh, but it's really important to understand the macroeconomic situation and scenario out there at the moment and to better inform yourself as to decisions you make for you and your family in terms of financial planning, etc. And as always, huge thanks to my Patreon and PayPal supporters. You guys are what enables me to keep getting out the message, get excellent guests, excellent experts, and counter, and this is so important, counter the misinformation and disinformation that's coming from our legacy media and so many biased corporate outlets. So thanks so much, guys, and anyone else who can hop on board my Patreon. I do monthly Zoom calls and vlogs, depending on the tier level, um, and also PayPal donations. Really, really appreciate it. And let's keep getting the plankton. (laughs) No derogatory sense there. But let's keep getting the people informed. And as Matthew says, we're being treated like plankton. Uh, Let's get informed. Let's share the knowledge. And let's rise up a little against the various deviants and devious people who are trying to make our world a worse place to be. Thank you.